Welcome to the Watchman Channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963 thank you all so much for your prayers and support god bless the bible indicates that there will be a great apostasy during the end times as we read in second thessalonians 2 3 let no one deceive you by any means for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed the son of perdition falling away is the greek word apostasia which means defection from the truth properly the state apostasy. Apostasia, from which we get the English word apostasy, refers to a general defection from the true God, the Bible, and the Christian faith. Jesus warned the disciples concerning the final days, as we read in Matthew 24, 10-12. And then many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. These are the characteristics of the great apostasy of the end times. By looking at the news headlines of our world today, there can be no doubt we are living in the final moments before Jesus' return. Dragon, this is what you need to do. Step one, thigh you a fatty. Okay. Okay. But step two, she gotta have a fatty. Hey. <laughs> uh oh. What is she doing? Friends, I don't have a fatty. <laughs> Charles Spurgeon was way ahead of his time when he said, If you have to give a carnival to get people to come to church, then you will have to keep giving carnivals to keep them coming back. In the New Testament, Jesus warns his followers about false prophets as we read in Matthew 7, 15-20. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits you will know them. Jesus then gives a dire warning to false prophets as we read in Matthew 7, 21-23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Scripture teaches believers to be diligent in faith and devotion to Christ's teachings, so that they will be able to spot false prophets and false teachers quickly. 1 Timothy 4.1 now the Spirit expressly says that in the latter time some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. 1 John 4.1 Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, for many false prophets have gone out into the world. What does it mean to test the spirits? The reason for the admonition to test the spirits, or test all things, is that there are many false prophets, or wolves in sheep's clothing, that try to lead Christians astray. Sadly. There are many people who claim to speak for God who are presenting a false gospel that is powerless to save. Such errant teaching leaves people with a false hope of salvation. 2 Corinthians 11:13 13-15 warns us, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, 
transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. The reason for testing the spirits is to see if it is truly from God, or if it is a lie from Satan and his servants. The test is to compare what is being taught with the clear teaching of the Bible. The Bible alone is the Word of God. It alone is inspired and inerrant. Therefore, the way to test the spirits is to see if what is being taught is in line with the clear teaching of Scripture. In Acts 17, 10, and 11, the Berean Jews were commended because after they heard the teachings of Paul and Silas, they examined the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. The Bereans were called noble for doing so. Testing the spirits means that one must know how to examine the scriptures. Rather than accept every teaching, discerning Christians diligently study the scriptures. Then they know what the Bible says and therefore can test all things and hold fast to what is true. In order to do this, a Christian must be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. The word of God is to be a lamp and a light to our path. We must let its light shine on the teachings and doctrines of the day. The Bible alone is the standard by which all truth must be judged. 2 Timothy 3:16 and 17 All scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Jesus said, as a sign of his coming and the end of the age, there would be an increase in deception, false Christ who will deceive many, wars and rumors of wars, nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, Christian persecution, apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold. Jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. As we get closer to Jesus' return, all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense. All of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time. John 15, 18 through 20. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. Jesus said as a sign of his coming and the end of the age, Christians would be persecuted as we read in Matthew 24, 9, and Luke 21, 12. Matthew 24, 9 Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Luke 21, 12 But before all these things, they will lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons. You will be brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. What are you guys doing? Get your gloves off. What are you doing? He's so far away. He's so far away. What are you guys doing? You guys are psychos. You guys are Freemason, Illuminati, psychos. He's beyond 200 meters away. You guys need to repent. All you CPS. A warrant. You big babies. Working for a psycho Satanist. Jesus is Lord died for your sins. This city is going to be destroyed by God's wrath. This is the last call. This is the last call. Oh, you're checking him. Oh, does he have weapons? He has a Bible. He has a Bible. What condition did I breach? Right, right. What condition? Tell us, officers. What condition is it? See, they don't tell us. Why are they arresting me? Unbelievable. Matthew 5, 10 through 12. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you, and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecute the prophets who were before you. Remember to pray for our persecuted brothers and sisters in Christ. Remember the prisoners as if chained with them, those who are mistreated, since you yourselves are in the body also. Hebrews 13.3 1 Corinthians 12.26 And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. 
Well, a mother of five in Oregon has filed a federal complaint against officials with the State Department of Human Services because she was allegedly barred from adopting children because of her Christian beliefs about gender and sexuality. Let's bring in that plaintiff, Jessica Bates, and her attorney from the Alliance Defending Freedom, Christiana Kiefer. I just want to make sure we got this right. You were turned down because of your beliefs, your religious beliefs on gender and sexuality. Explain that. Correct. Yeah, um, I had started the process to adopt and made it through, a, you know, it took a few months and made it through the resource and adoptive families training. And at the end of that, I let them know that I couldn't support uh, the state's ideology, their views on sexual orientation and gender identity because of my faith. Mm -hmm. And a couple took a couple months, but at, at that point, they sent me an official letter of denial um, on my application. I want to read part of your complaint, Jessica, and then we'll have Christiana kind of respond to this. It says, quoting here, under this rule, caregivers must agree to use child's preferred pronouns, take a child to affirming events like pride parades, or sign the child up for dangerous pharmaceutical interventions like puberty blockers and hormone shots. No matter a child's age, no matter whether a child actually desires these things, and no matter how deeply these requirements violate the caregiver's religious convictions. Christiana, vol violation clearly of religious freedom here. You're exactly right. Oregon is essentially using an ideological litmus test. It welcomes people from all cultural and religious backgrounds to adopt unless they disagree with the state's gender ideology. And barring an incredible mom like Jessica from adopting simply because of her religious convictions clearly violates the First Amendment and hurts children. Loudoun County Public Schools allegedly banning a teacher from including a well-known Bible verse, including this one, John 316, in her email signature. The teacher's lawyer says the school's policy allows her to use personally selected pronouns, quotations, pictures, or phrases that are intended to express the teacher's personal views on a variety of subjects and that are attributable to the teachers. Roger Gannam is the Assistant VP of Legal Affairs at Liberty Council. Roger joins us now. Roger, that's standard. That put was put out by Loudoun County, and that seems pretty clear. What's wrong with John 316 when it comes to that standard? The Loudoun County standard uh, really is no standard. What they've said is that teachers can write whatever they want in their signature blocks as long as it's not religious, and that's the definition of religious discrimination under the Constitution. Here, the school board obviously can have a policy about what teachers include in their email signature blocks, but if their policy is to let teachers say anything they want, they can't exclude religious speech. Uh, and so we brought that to the school board's attention and trying to, to show them why they're wrong. Here's the Bible verse in question. John 3:16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. 1 Peter 2, 7 and 8. So the honor is for you who believe. But for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. Now to the case of the disappearing killers. Now a few hours ago, Louisville police released body cam footage of officers who were responding to that horrific shooting. Now we're not gonna play them frame by frame out of respect for the victims, but you can see frames from the moment before police stormed the building and a still of the killer roaming the halls of the bank. We now know that the shooter was said to have known about his impending firing, but we also know that he was sympathetic to BLM and harbored deep anti-Trump sentiments. It's safe to say that you won't hear more, much more about him at this point. Much like we've stopped hearing about the motivations behind the Nashville shooter. But a new survey shows the public, well, it's demanding more. A Rasmussen poll out today shows that two-thirds of the U.S. voters say they want Nashville police to release the manifesto re written by the shooter of that uh, Christian school. And the name, of course, of the shooter was Audrey Hale. The manifesto festo was written. We were promised to see at least part of it. Haven't really heard anything about it. Joining me now, founder and CEO of Turning Point USA, Charlie Kirk. So we now have two leftist mass shooters in the last two weeks and the response from our media and our political class and the establishment on the left is we've got to take guns away from conservatives. That's yep. cute, isn't it? 
Yeah, that's right. And praise God, there wasn't a third in Colorado. Thankfully, that one was thwarted, but it seems that one was ideologically driven as well. You know, it's, it's what's missing that is most interesting. In the last 10 days or two weeks, do you notice that we haven't seen these long profile pieces of journalists going to Tennessee and talking to the classmates of the shooter? What was this person like? Did they have certain sentiments? Was this trans ideology introduced? When was the turning point there? There's been some articles, but nothing close to what we saw, for example, with the Buffalo shooter. Remember, that manifesto was released almost immediately because in the manifesto, the great replacement theory was floated. That's useful to the media. Or how about mm. the horrendous tragedy that happened in South Carolina? That was immediately mentioned because they said that was racially motivated. You see, if there is a tragedy that happens in America that does not fit a narrative, they try to bury it or they try to go to guns immediately. Basically, it's they, they say Heads I win, tails you lose. No matter what, we're going to rig the game. We're going to set the narrative in a way that fits our own convenience. However, you hit on something important that we cannot lose focus on, which is a question that deserves answering. Is this trans ideology and the pharmacological agents that go along with trans ideology creating violent and erratic behavior? I think mm. the families from the Nashville school deserve an answer to that. Well, Charlie, isn't it also the case that the the left in America and it, even this White House is ginning up without saying the words necessarily. Yes. But ginning up anti-Christian sentiment by by referring to, you know, trans activists as heroes and their braver, their bravery for standing up against the intolerant class, the haters. These kids are learn are learning to, to treat Christians as haters and mortal threats to their existence. So who's responsible for that propaganda, Charlie? Well, well, not to mention Riley Gaines just was held hostage for multiple hours at a Turning Point USA event last week right. by trans activists. Kareen Jean-Pierre said, and I, I want to make sure I quote her correctly, but something of the essence of the, the, you need to fight back. You need to fight this sort of using rather charged language. Not to mention uh, the Biden administration came out and said that trans activists shape the soul of the nation. They shape the fabric of the nation. And these are not isolated incidents. This is now a pattern. And when we start to see a pattern emerge, we need to be able to have the courage and the willingness to point out that pattern and say, you're not a protected class in the sense that you're allowed to act outrageously and violent and go after people that you disagree with and use these sort of intimidation tactics. The media is intentionally not investigating these. And I'm, I pray, Laura, I'm wrong. I think there's something in that manifesto that they don't want us to see. I think there's something in that manifesto that shows that this is a social contagion that infected this poor person, that turned into an evil person, and it committed something unspeakable. I, I pray I'm wrong, but this seems like a cover-up, and mm. they, they have an agenda behind it. Well, Charlie, I just keep thinking about all these young, these people were young children. They were young boys and girls, and they were growing up, and something happened to them. And it, it seems know. demonic at this point. It's so evil. Brothers and sisters, persecution is coming. Believers in Jesus Christ, believe in the authority of the Bible. We believe homosexuality is a sin and marriage is between one man and one woman. We believe in the sanctity of life and that abortion is murder and is a sin. We believe God created us male and female and it is a sin to identify as a transgender. We believe Jesus is the only way to heaven and that believing in any other way will send a person to hell. Get yourself spiritually prepared because true Christians will be persecuted like no other time in history. This persecution will be based off of what the world perceives to be moral and right, and not what the Bible says. The sad thing is that many people who profess to be Christ followers will go the way of the world. These professing Christians are called lukewarm in the book of Revelation and are not saved. The world will persecute true Christians, and scripture tells us the lukewarm Christians will persecute them as well, as we read in Matthew 24, 9 and 10. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. Many who professed faith in Jesus as the Messiah in easier times will deny him and cooperate in exposing those who are true believers. The external hatred from the world puts all true believers in Christ under pressure. This in turn produces internal hatred among the professing Christian community during the tribulation. When the pressure comes, those who are not genuine believers will do three things. Fall away, deliver up one another, and hate one another. Matthew 24, 9 and 10 
lay out a future time of great persecution for true believers in Jesus. Many in the church will avoid this persecution by betraying fellow disciples in Christ to the persecutors. Persecution is coming. Brothers and sisters, put on the whole armor of God. Ephesians 6, 10-18 Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always, with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end, with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Now to North Korea's latest missile launch overnight, it prompted Japan to issue an emergency warning to residents to seek shelter. Britt Clennett is tracking the story from Taiwan. Good morning, Britt. Good morning, George. Yeah, North Korea ramping up tension in this region again, firing another missile, the 12th already this year. Now, the launch causing a scare in Japan's Hokkaido Island. Air raid sirens blaring out there over fears that the missile could have hit the area. Now, the Japanese government called off an evacuation order after 20 minutes. South Korea saying the missile actually landed in the sea east of North Korea. Now, Japan saying it may have actually been a type of ICBM. You'll remember those are the missiles that are capable of striking anywhere in the continental United States. And the U.S. condemning, of course, the latest launch, calling it a brazen violation of multiple U.N. resolutions and saying it will do what it takes to guarantee the safety of America and its allies. Let's begin here in South Florida, where torrential rain caused major flooding overnight. A rare flash flood emergency alert warned of life-threatening conditions after torrential rain made roads impossible to navigate and trap people in their cars. It's being called a one-in-a-thousand-year flood event. We're at the airport, and behind me, you can see why it remains shut down. There's water covering the tarmac, but also back there, what resembles a big lake right now, that's the runway. It is submerged, and the airport is not scheduled to reopen until at least noon today. This area got more than 26 inches of rain in just an eight-hour period. To put that into perspective, that's about 40 percent of their annual rainfall in just one day. Some South Florida streets resembled rivers Wednesday. I've never seen this much rain. Leaving cars either stuck, nearly submerged, or even abandoned. I see like 20 cars stall out, and uh, guys, I tell one guy, don't drive. Inundated roads force people to wade through knee high waters, some even plunging in just across the street. Now is not the time to be on the roadway. Authorities are urging residents to seek higher ground and stay off the roads. Look at these houses. You got. Rising water from the relentless rain swamped this hospital parking lot in Fort Lauderdale and flooded many garages like Andres Cicades. I've lived here for the last four years, and as much rain as we get, this is this is the worst I've ever seen it. Meanwhile, another weather extreme is taking hold in other parts of the country. Record heat is possible today and tomorrow from Washington, D.C. to Boston. Temperatures nearly 30 degrees above normal. Dry and hot conditions fueling this forest fire in New Jersey. People from Denver to Minneapolis also seeing record warmth. The heat triggering rapid snow melt. Authorities on alert for river flooding in 11 states from California to Michigan. Some rivers in the upper Midwest could reach major flood stage this weekend. And in central California, farmers are bracing as all that snow, which set records this winter, begins flowing downstream. You can see Lake Tulare lapping up on this road for the first time in some 40 years. But this is Sixth Avenue. It's a main thoroughfare through some of America's most productive farmland that for the next 10 miles is several feet underwater. Kana Whitworth spoke to one farmer trying to contain the flooding after a nearby levee breached. There is no stopping this. No. 
Jesus said a sign of his return would be more frequent and more intense weather as we read in Matthew 24, 7 and 8. And there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Pestilence is the Greek word loimus, which means a plague. Definition of a plague is any large-scale calamity, especially when thought to be sent by God. God has used plagues in the form of extreme weather in the past and will again in the future. The seventh plague on Egypt was hail. Don't forget about the famine in Joseph's time. One of the biggest is the flood in the book of Genesis. In the future, during the seven-year tribulation, God will once again use extreme weather in the form of pestilence as judgment. In Revelation 16:21, God uses hailstones weighing 100 pounds each, and great hail from heaven fell upon men, each hailstone about the weight of a talent. Men blaspheme God because of the plague of the hail, since that plague was exceedingly great. In Revelation 16:8 8 and 9, God uses scorching heat. Then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and power was given to him to scorch men with fire, and men were scorched with great heat. And they blasphemed the name of God who has power over these plagues, and they did not repent and give him glory. So when Jesus Christ warns us that just before his second coming, there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places, you had better believe that these occurrences are a sign from God and that he is about to intervene. Jesus, speaking to his disciples about the signs of his coming and the end of the age, declares this in Matthew 24, 12. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. The Bible tells us lawlessness is the violation of God's commandments, as we read in 1 John 3, 4. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. Sin will be so rampant and so commonplace in the last days that the love people once had for one another, for many, will be non-existent. In this prophecy, Jesus Christ is describing an ongoing breakdown in the relationship with God. And since people's love for God is waning, it will be evident in the way people treat one another as well. A symptom may be that the love toward other people is decreasing, but the real cause is that the relationship with God is cooling off. This is what we are witnessing in our world today. A shocking new survey reveals just how widespread gun violence is in this country. Just listen to these numbers. Nearly one in five adults, one in five, say they have had a family member killed with a gun. That's according to a new survey from KFF. For black Americans, that statistic is even worse, one in three. And 84% of adults say they have taken at least one precaution to try to protect themselves or their families from gun violence. And that is not the only disturbing number in this survey. There is more. Nikki Batiste has the details. There's only so many times you can walk into a room and tell someone they're not coming home tomorrow. And it just breaks your heart. Louisville trauma surgeon Jason Smith says he has seen and had enough. I'm weary. He's not the only one seeing the effects of gun violence firsthand. In a new survey on the impact of gun violence, KFF found that 54% of adults said they have or a family member has experienced a gun-related incident, such as being threatened with a gun or having a family member killed by a gun, including by suicide. Ashley Kurtzinger was one of the survey's lead authors. To her, it's personal. My sister was accidentally shot in the back. So thankful that she survived, but I can tell you firsthand it's impacted my family. Hers and so many others, from mass shootings at concerts, movie theaters, places of worship, supermarkets, schools, and inside the workplace. It's a toll that keeps mounting. The survey found 15% of people have avoided religious services or celebrations, 20% have changed or considered changing their child's school, and 35% have avoided large crowds because of the possibility of gun violence. Sadly, the spate of leftist violence we have seen isn't isolated to shootings. On Easter Sunday in Portland, Oregon, an innocent cab driver was stabbed to death by a trans individual. Now, according to Andy, no, the suspect had a history of violent behavior that the local media and authorities papered over due to, of course, this idea that the trans people are a protected class. So the result? A senseless murder. Joining me now with more on this horrific story, senior editor at the Post Millennial, Andy No. This horrific mur murder that happened on Easter Sunday in Portland when police released a, a press release about it, I thought it was a little bit weird that the suspect's name wasn't released right away because a suspect was in custody. 
uh, there was delaying. And when that name came out, there was, the police didn't use pronouns and it was also very vague. And mm. so often with many of these suspects, we can learn a lot about them from their social media. So immediately I looked up this individual and found out it is a transgender identifying person. The murder of the taxi driver in Portland was, was captured in the, the in interior vehicle camera. And I spoke to a source oh. who, who saw the video. Um, it, has, it was described to me as, um, as, as gruesome and horrific. The suspect allegedly went inside the, the vehicle while wearing a tiara and then later um, plunging a, a blade into the neck of the driver. Andy, there's something, there's something going on here that the media, they, they don't want to confront because if you really confront it, it collapses their whole narrative. And I think we're going to learn more about this. Sadly, there'll probably be more victims. We hope there aren't. Uh, but thank you for getting very curious about this in ways that journalists today are not. The Apostle Paul, in his epistle to Timothy, tells us in the last days, society will be in a total immoral meltdown. 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. But know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, and from such people turn away. Romans chapter 1 tells us God has revealed to mankind that He is the Creator of all things, and that He has made it known to mankind that they are without excuse through His creation that He exists. God demands that we worship Him and recognize Him as the Creator. And when a society does not glorify Him as God, He gives them up to three phases of judgment. Romans 1 verse 24 says, Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness and the lust of their hearts. The first phase of judgment is an impure heart. The second phase of judgment is of the body, verses 26 and 27. For this reason God gave them up to vile passions, for even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another, men with men committing what is shameful, and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error which was due. The third phase of judgment is in verse 28, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind, to do those things which are not fitting. First, the heart is rotten, then the body follows, and then the mind goes. The moral law of God written on the heart has literally been stomped out and replaced with cultural immorality. Immorality now goes in every direction. The mind is corrupt. People don't think right. They advocate all the wretched things and depreciate all the virtuous things. And what flows out of this pornographic, homosexual, depraved culture? All evil, verses 29 through 32. Being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. There can be no doubt we are living in the end times right before Jesus Christ returns as we link 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5 with Romans 1, 28 through 32. The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now, and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. Admit that you're a sinner. B. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C. Call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with him and the Father. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive, in faith, the salvation God offers 
Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in him and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation, repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. Biblical repentance is changing your mind about Jesus Christ and turning to God in faith for salvation. Turning from sin is not the definition of repentance, but it is one of the results of genuine faith-based repentance towards the Lord Jesus Christ. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning? My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready! is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today.